Hello, this is Tom, a.k.a. Jedio here for Tabletop Tap Room. And we're doing a 1E Rediscovered uh, series. And I really hadn't planned this to be a series. I was uh, I just had been sitting down and reading the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide. And I, so I did a little video on my rediscovery that um, as kids, I don't think we really even played 1E. My gateway to Dungeons & Dragons was Basic Expert, Mold, Moldvay Edition. And so we had started playing Basic and Expert. So we just kind of fudged turning our campaign into an advanced campaign, buying advanced modules and, you know, got to have the, you know, monster manual, got to get the deities and demigods, got to get, uh, you know, when eventually Fiendfolio came out. So... I've made this discovery that I really didn't know D&D. Uh, &D. So I did the video. Um, I actually did the um, I did the video that was rediscovering 1E and just talked about some of the things that I was like, whoa, whoa, uh, problems I found that, wow, I, I guess I didn't really know 1E in the first video. But since that time, um, you know, somebody else has jumped on the bandwagon doing rediscovering 1E videos, and and um, and I had been thinking, oh, so I've I've basically done the player's handbook. Now we're going to do the game master, dungeon master's guide. Well, there's a lot to the dungeon master's guide, so I actually think we will uh, break it down into smaller bites, and that's what this video is: is a smaller bite from the dungeon master's guide of AD and D first edition. The misnomer first edition because it's really not the first edition. Um, but I, so I, what I've prepared here is I've got the uh, PDF of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, DMG. I apologize. I had to go looking for this online, and this scan cuts off the edge here, but you can still read it. And then over here, I have a PDF of the Moldvay Basic. For some comparison. So we're going to be looking at this chapter on uh, creating the player character because I was in the process of reading the books. I was like, oh, this should, should well player character. So I grabbed the player's handbook and I'm like, I can't find the rule on generating ability scores. I'm looking for it. It's not there. It must be there. I mean, I know how to generate ability scores. Roll 3d6, right? Just roll 3d6. But I'm not finding it. And it's so I go looking and I find it here in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And I got four different methods and none of them are what I remember. So then I'm like, wait a minute. Basic is involved here. So let's go back and look at basic. And here it is. It's rule number two on this page. Well, it's page B5 in the basic rule book. Uh, roll 3D6 uh, for a result of 3 to 18 for each ability and put the results in pencil next to the name of the ability score. Basically, roll 3D6 and arrange them in order. Done. And, and that's how you do it in basic. And that's how we must have done it. And that's how I remember it. Now, over the years, you know, you watch videos. I watch Professor Dungeon Master over Dungeon Craft. Great channel, by the way. I'll put a link. You should check it out. Um, you know, and, 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 and not just him, but others. And you, you get this edifice, this Oedipus built up. Edifice, not Oedipus. Yeah, that's a different thing altogether. Uh, edi this edifice built up in your mind about 1E. And, you know, and it involves nostalgia from what you kind of hazily remember. You pick up little pieces and videos here and there. So you get this idea like 1E was this harder addition, grittier characters are more fragile. It really can suck to, you know, be a first level player character, especially a magic user in 1E. Um, and what I'm finding is not quite the truth about that. It's really not quite the truth. And uh, so as I looked at these um, ability score generation methods, method one is, uh, and this is the one I'm most likely to use, 
It's uh, all scores are recorded and arranged in the order the player desires. Roll 46, uh, and the lowest is discarded. This is the simplest method of the four. I'm most likely to just, particularly if it's a pickup game, that's that's the method we're using. Because uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a one shot. So, boom. Method two. All scores are recorded and arranged as in method one. Basically, we're going to roll these scores. You get to arrange them in whatever order you want. But what we're doing is we're rolling 3D6 is rolled 12 times, and the highest six scores are retained. Well, this is this, both methods are going to produce an above average character. The basic 3D6, put them in order, live with it. That's not necessarily going to produce the character you want to play. It's not necessarily going to produce a playable character. You could end up with a, you know, character with a, you know, a four and a five and a six for ability scores. You might as well kill the character now and start over. Uh, but this is going to produce an above average character. Uh, method three, scores are rolled according to each ability category in order. So you're going to roll 3d6 six times for strength. Pick the highest one. Do the same for intelligence. Pick the highest one. Do the same for dex, for wisdom. Well, of, of course, how can you not get an above average character? I mean, you shouldn't have any negative scores any any ability scores that have a penalty, you know, a minus one for something with this method. I I like this method. The method two and three, I like them the least. Method four, I like the most, even though I'm not as likely to use it because method one is just simple. Method four is 3D6 is rolled sufficient times to generate six abilities in order for 12 characters. So it's just like the basic method, 3D6, record them in order. But you do it 12 times, and then you pick the character that you want to play. I like this because we're, we're not trying to get a superhuman character. We're not trying to get Superman, but it, you're going to get 12 sets of stats and if you're really bent on playing a, a paladin or if you're really bent on playing a thief or you're really bent on playing a, a magic user, you're going to be able to pick the stats that will let you play that. And, you know, so that's why I like method four the most. But I recognize that it's a lot of extra work, you know, whereas method one probably will produce some of the same results as method four close to the same results without it being that big a deal <clears throat> simpler and sometimes simpler is better so uh, I, you know i'm all for method one or method four but it should be recognized that this system is going to produce above average characters and I think that's okay. Um, you know, some of the grim dark games, characters are intended to be victims. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, it is. And some of the old artwork shows the characters being victims. You know, getting stabbed in the face, getting uh, getting zapped by, a, you know, a wizard, getting. You know, bad things happening. You know, some of the some of this older artwork that we have kind of shows the players like not faring well in the dungeon, and and, and you know that, that that's kind of an interesting um, to me. That's that's it's a fascinating uh, that you had that. Whereas in fifth edition, characters are superheroes; they're never going to die. They won't die. You got tons of hit points. Not only do you have tons of hit points, but you, you also have death saves. Um, so you're just never going to die. You're a superhero, faster than a speeding bullet, you know, able to leap tall buildings, single bound. And um, the perception has been that the old school was much more fragile. and But that's not necessarily playing out in my read of 1E. 
you know, we're producing better characters and even the hit points are higher in one E over basic, you know, basic, uh, the hit dice for a fighter in basics D eight hit dice for a fighter in, uh, in one E is D 10. So as we scroll down the page, we've generated ability scores for the player character. Um, they've been assigned to the character sheet. We come to this little section on non-player characters. And so we've got special characters, including henchmen, how to generate general characters. I like this general characters um, entry here. 3D6 for each ability score, as usual. But the average scoring is um, by, by considering any one. So if you roll a one, it's actually a three. If you roll a six, it's actually a four. So... These are just general characters, and they're going to be very middle-of-the-road general characters. Um, they're not going to suck too bad, but they're not going to outshine the player characters. I think that's important because we're actually doing above-average characters who are supposed to be the heroes. They are the adventurers. They are the heroes. This is not a grimdark game where they're just victims waiting for the TPK. <clears throat> so I just, you know, in noticing this, you know, rules for uh, non generating non-player characters, general characters, and then uh, special characters, including henchmen. We get a paragraph on the effects of a wish on ability scores. Um, interesting discussion. I don't think it's germane because I'm not anticipating running a game until uh, the player's characters reach the level of having a wish spell. I don't even know if the wish spell is available in my game. I'm just not sure about that. It's not a decision I'm making at this point. So I'm not going to worry about it. Um, so it's not that big a deal. You get into the player characters. Um, we've got uh, height and weight is discussed here. But he, this next table, and so it, it made me think of a list I downloaded uh, a year ago from Professor Dungeon Master uh, when I was a member of the Patreon uh, patron campaign before he produced his Deathbringer RPG. People had been at, hey, you're going to do, uh, we love your videos, you're going to do a, your own RPG. And, and, and at first he was kind of resistive, nah, nah, nah. And, um, and eventually he just gave in and did. And so he puts out Deathbringer. And they, he'd put out a list like this for uh, player character professions before they went into their adventuring career. But he plays It's a Grim Dark Game. So, you know, his thing was things like the gong farmer. The gong farmer was the guy who went around with a cart and shoveled out the privies. And then he wheeled the poop out to the farm and sold it to the farmer to use for fertilizer. So, you know, not a very glamorous job. <laughs> What'd you do before you became a paladin? Oh, I used to shovel the crap. <laughs> you, know, it's just, you know, it's horrible. You know, a rat catcher, um, the, the rag and bone man, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was these really obscure, uh, medieval, not very glamorous professions before they became an adventurer. And uh, so it was an interesting table, and it had interesting results. It's very different from this table because this table, uh, you look at these things. These things actually give the player characters a uh, story share. Let me see if I can blow it up a little more. Um, armor, boyer, farmer, fish, uh, fisher, forester, gambler, hunter, husbandman for you know, uh, animal husbandry. You know, like being a teamster, managing animals, a jeweler, leather worker, uh, limner, painter, mason, carpenter, miner, navigator. That could be fresh or salt water. Make the decision. Uh, sailor, fresh or salt water. Shipwright, um, boats or ships. I wouldn't give them both. You know, the, you know how to build a boat. You know, it, so you have the basics for the other. You can apply your knowledge. Teamster, freighter, trader, um, trapper. Would... So these things, they're not super heroic, but they do give story share. They, it sure beats the crap out of being a, a 
the gong farmer, you know, shoveling the poo. So, <laughs> and I would just go ahead and as part of player character creation, I would go ahead and give, let the players roll on this table and, and get one of these, um, you know, absolutely. And then if you ever need to, to test on this, um, Without seeing that there's a mechanic in the rules for it, I my knee-jerk reaction would be D20, uh, roll below your intelligence or whatever uh, ability score I think should be tested on for this skill. For example, gambler, I could very well call for you to test on your charisma. If you're doing something at the gambling table, I you know, Roll your charisma or less with a D20. <clears throat> so that's that's where I would go with that. But these could definitely give uh, a player character story share. It's really up to what the player makes of this with their character. So absolutely, I would do that. I would absolutely use that. Uh, I think that's fabulous. And we, we get into... Um, starting level of experience you get all this gigaxian pros here just to say you start at zero. First level zero experience points there's no you know uh, there was a lot of discussion for what i don't i don't understand we then get into character aging uh age aging disease and death and it's handled that way a there's starting age aging disease and death and I don't know why they put disease it's because death here actually ties back into all this aging stuff. So we'll skip disease and, and go right to this age at death um, generation. But you've got the tables here for uh, generating the age of all of these races in their profession. But then you have the humans table, which is separate. And... Um, we then have the age categories by race uh, in young adult, mature, middle-aged, old, venerable. And as you transition from one of these to the other, there are ability score penalties and bonuses. For instance, um, going from young adult to mature, you add one point of strength and add one point of wisdom. So, you know, let's go back and look at... We got a fighter. Fighter is 15 years plus one D4. So let's say we rolled a four and he is 19 years old, starting out as a fighter. Uh, a human is a young adult up to age 20. When they hit 21, they become mature. So this fighter is not far away from a bump on his strength getting a plus one to strength and a plus one to, uh, to wisdom. Not bad. That's really not bad at all. Um, so that's actually a good thing. And you say, well, we're going to have to keep track of um, the calendar. We're going to have to keep track. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah, maybe not. Because we have unnatural aging. For instance, you have all these spells here, which carry a penalty in aging. But those are all high-level spells, and I don't anticipate them really coming into the campaign. Uh, uh, alter reality spell, gate spell, limited wish, restoration, resurrection, wish spell, all of these. They have a penalty for casting it, and I like that. I like putting a penalty on these spells that if you come looking to, for a high-level cleric to, to cast resurrection for you... Um, you know, he's thinking about this penalty. It's going to age him three years. You're going to have to grease the wheels. You're going to have to grease his palm to get him to cast that spell. He's not going to cast it lightly for just anybody. He's going to look for some compensation. And that's going to require some role playing on the player character's part. He's going to be looking for, you know, magic items. He's going to be looking for money. You know, he's going to be, he's, you know, and this is not him being a greedy evangelist, this cleric. This is just him going, it's going to age me three years. You need to pay for that, <laughs> which is only fair and right. So 
Um, the last two items on this unnatural aging are imbibing a speed potion or uh, under a haste spell. So uh, these age you one year. And I like that because these are the two that are likely to turn up in the campaign. Speed potion, haste spell. Haste spell is a, is a third level spell. And that means a, a magic user would get it at level five. So that's these are likely to turn up. In fact, now that I know that there's a consequence for, for using these, that they age you a year, it's more likely a, a scroll, spell scroll with haste spell and potions of speed turning up. And I'm just not going to tell the players that, oh, if you use this, there is a consequence. You get aged a year. Now, the fighter, he's 19 years old, so he, he pounds a couple of hits of speed off of a speed potion and ages two years. He's now 21. He gets that bump in strength. That, that could be something that's handy. Oh, that's exciting. It's exciting until that human turns 40, and then he's, he's uh, subtract a point of strength and a point of constitution, and add one point of intelligence and one point of wisdom. So he's getting older and wiser, and there are consequences. And I like that. And, you know, you're not going to have to track this so closely, but it is something you'll track, and you'll just double-check on it between adventures during the campaign. But you can certainly file in your head, speed, haste, one year of aging. It's easy to remember. I know I'm going to remember it. So I would uh, absolutely use this age and aging within my campaign because it's something that could bring about some nice bumps in the uh, ability scores that the player maybe wasn't expecting. Um, you know, but then they're like, oh, oh, I got another point of strength. You know, I'm suddenly now a plus two. Is, you know, with strength. It, all right. You know, you, you, it could be exciting. So I would absolutely use that. Now, after this, we get into disease. Let's skip that and go right to after disease. We get this determination, uh, death due to age, and the determination of the maximum age that that character can live. So you're going to, you're going to roll on, um, you know, the percentage score here, and, and it'll say the oldest, you know, the age category is old, lowest age. So you start with the, um, with our fighter. We're going to go to the old category. Oh, wait a minute. And then it's uh, a D8, plus D8. So we're going to go to the old category here uh, for a human, and the lowest age is 61, plus a D8, so we're going to roll D8. Let's say it's a 5, so he'll die at age 66. That's how old that character will live. I will record that on the, you know, I keep a little note sheet on each character in my campaign. I'll record that. This character will die at age 60, 66. He won't live any far past that. So if you start having a lot of unnatural aging going on, Maybe we visit the Outer Plains and there's some weird magical effects going on. I don't know. But if you start having, suddenly we start getting close to a point where suddenly you're looking, how can I, you know, is there a fountain of youth and can we quest for that type of thing? So um, I would absolutely record this um, maximum character age. And... Just let the dice decide and record it and file it away. If the campaign goes on long enough, there's a potential somebody could run up against this. So uh, definitely. Now let's back up to diseases. This is a fantastic Game Master toolbox right here, this diseases. Not that you would want to be rolling this at the table during gameplay. Forget that. That'll slow down gameplay. It'll be like it'll be like playing Roll Master. Forget about it. Uh, you roll this ahead of time. So we've got some notes here on uh, contraction of a disease, contraction of a disease, contraction of a parasite infection, um, 
chance of contracting a disease, base chance, base chance of co contracting parasitic infection. Here's the gem in all of this, is this table, disease or disorder table. It doesn't actually give you blue plague, um, you know, orc scabies. It doesn't give you anything like that. It just gives you a list of bodily functions that could be affected. And then it gives you a table to generate whether it's acute or chronic, and then whether it's mild, severe, or terminal. And yeah, terminal is what it means, except not everything on here is terminal. For example, eyes with terminal severity, you go blind. You don't actually die. Ears with terminal severity, you go deaf. You don't actually die. Uh, but other things, you will die. And uh, so I would actually roll on this, roll up a few diseases, a couple of diseases and one parasitic infection. And then name them, Take do the creative investment of, call it blue plague, half-orc scabies, whatever, um, you know, half-orc ringworm. <laughs> so, gnomish tapeworm. <coughs> so I would name it, maybe put a few symptoms in place and, and have all my notes on it, pre-generated, um, between adventures ahead of time and have my base chance for infection and some modifiers written uh, written down with it and have it in my game master notes so that if the occasion came up player characters fell into a privy they fell into a sewer they were exposed to infection i'll quietly roll see if they get the you know infection um and maybe i want to add Cure disease carries some unnatural aging, like six months maybe. I don't know. So <laughs> you're going to a high-level cleric, and he's like, yeah, uh, you know, there's, there's a cost here. Sorry, you know, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to age six months for free. You're going to have to pay for that. So, you know, I don't know. But uh, I would definitely, this is a fantastic Game Master toolbox. I would just go ahead and you, I would pre-generate my diseases, two diseases, one parasitic infection, and have my notes on them, you know, as I said. So this is the chapter on generating player character statistics, characteristics. I don't know why disease is in there. Everybody's got a, you get a disease. We're going to Oprah. We're going to Oprah these. You get a disease. You get, but I don't know. So I don't know why disease is in there, but it's okay that it is um, because it, this is a great game master tool. I'm absolutely going to use it. May never use the aging because if you're just doing a quick one shot, may never come into play, but a disease could come into play in a one shot. Um, you know, you fall into the the filth, uh, filthy pit where the the giant rats breed and live. Yeah, you could contract the disease very easy. You know, you're rolling around grappling with a, an orc, and you know, in an orc cave, and uh, you know, I might decide there's a chance you come down with orc scabies, something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> so absolutely cool toolkit. Now what comes after this is um, uh, player character, um, explanation of player character abilities. And we learn that uh, even though it says strength, it doesn't just mean strength. It means a little bit more. It doesn't just mean intelligence. It means a little bit more. You know, the, these are an abstraction. There's not strictly limited to um, Charisma is not just your how charismatic you are. It also, according to this, involves looks, whether you're good looking or not. Um, you know that uh, strength involves your stamina. So you've got these descriptions. I think it's important to read them and have them at the back of your mind as a game master. You get into um, next it says player character races. Now, remember, we're in the Dungeon Master's Guide, not the Player's Handbook, and it says player character racial tendencies. So I'm assuming a lot of this information is in the racial descriptions in the player's handbook. 
So these are just a overview for the Dungeon Master, but you could easily photocopy this and provide it to a new player. Hey, just read this. It'll get you an idea of how dwarves think and how elves think and so on and so forth. But I, again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure why it's in the DMG. I guess it's just there to brush you up as a game master. The next chapter that we get into here, and this is distinct from everything that we've just gone through before, it's character classes, followers for upper level player characters. And I want to handle this as a separate section with um, henchmen and retainers. So we'll do that as a whole nother video of Rediscovering 1E, upper level followers, retainers, and henchmen. Because I actually think that's an interesting aspect of 1E, that you would hire retainers, that you might attract a henchman who's going to stay with you a little bit more faithfully than a retainer who's just, hey, you didn't pay me. So uh, you, although the henchmen expect to get paid. So we're going to look at that as a separate uh, chapter in this series. So this is Tom for Tabletop Tap Room. I want to thank you for watching my video. Thanks for going on this, this uh, rediscovery journey of 1E. It seems timely based off of what's going on with the OGL and 5E. Uh, you know, now I guess is the time to check out some older editions again and, and reconnect with them because I'm actually thinking like I'd really like to play 1E, but I've, Heard over the years a lot of criticism of segments and weapon speed and certain things in uh, in uh, 1E that I'm I'm not entirely sure that I, I want to to make that part of my 1E experience. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll review this and we'll see what we discover as we go along uh, tackling topic by topic. Uh, with this, because uh, I anticipate being back in the player's handbook a little bit for henchmen and retainers. So this is uh, Tom for Tabletop Tap Room. I want to thank you for watching the video. Thanks for going on the journey with me. Thanks to my subscribers. You guys are great. And hey, if you've not hit the subscribe button, please do consider hitting the like, subscribe, and bell icon. Help me build the channel. And until I see you next time, keep on gaming. Mm -hmm.